Have a watch. All right, it is uh, 5.30. I'm going to get the class started. Um, first thing, you know, is just kind of personal interest. I actually read up on chat GPT last night. It's actually quite interesting um, because I have been uh, kind of playing with AI for a long time. You know, that was actually one of my uh, research topic in graduate school, but that was a long time ago. Um, but basically, you know, chat GPT was trained on everything that you can find on the internet without having to sign into an account. Um, I'll give you a, 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 you know, a, a guesstimate of scale. The entirety of Wikipedia consists of 3% of the training material. <laughs> that kind of gives you an idea of the scale of you know, what, how much data was used to train it. What I was also really surprised to find out was ChatGPT was not actually hard coded to do logic. There's no, you know, as far as I know, you know, the, it, there's no built in uh, propositional logic or you know, predicate logic engine to it, but it can do it because it has read enough text about reasoning that it can figure out the pattern. Now, is it perfect? No, because I gave it a problem to solve and it, it, it explained the answer you know, slightly incorrectly at one single place. But otherwise it was able to figure out you know, how to do the calculation. It was a word problem. It had to be able to interpret the word problem to begin with and then be able to do the calculation and it was able to do it. So now, you know, when, when my students in CIFT 440 go like, but that question is totally confusing. You know, I have no idea how to do it. I go like, but chat GPT does. <laughs> <clears throat> which, is, which is really, really interesting. Yeah. Um, and just talking about chat GPT, uh, reminded me that uh, the cybersecurity page that I follow, uh, it goes to like the thing where uh, chat, chat GPT had uh, passed an entry level uh, coding position for Google, uh, which would have like been like the average salary of one hundred eighty three thousand dollars a year. Um, Aren't you feeling encouraged? You know, because you know, your first job, you, you now now your top competitor is chat GPT, <laughs> which in 18 months is going to be doubled in terms of, you know, computation power, as well as storage, according to um, Moore's law. Yeah, and then uh, I guess PC Max uh, Magazine had asked uh, chat GPT if it will ever replace software engineers. And uh, it responded because no, uh, basically that chat GPT will be used as a tool for software engineers. But it won't ever be something that can be a standalone replacement. So well, okay, so I read about that portion too, because Chat GPT is one product, 
the, uh, the part that can do program is called Codex, uh, C-O-D-E-X. So it's a separate product, but they kind of you know, integrate the two products into one. So Codex is a little bit different. It's basically trained on description versus code, description versus code, description versus code. So I don't think it is actively trying to figure out you know, how to code based on you know, what you're trying to do. It is actually more of a map in that case instead of actually trying to figure out the code itself. Um, but from the other aspect of ChatGPT being able to you know, just look, just read enough you know, text content about reasoning you know, on different subject matter and be able to apply you know, that reasoning ability uh, is really surprising to me because you know, it, it was not hard coded to solve you know, logical problem, analytical problem, you know, statistics problem. But by reading enough material, it was able to figure out just using words, okay? It's just using words and patterns. It's able to you know, work out the steps. So that part totally surprised me. Yes. Huh? How do they work? Sorry, I'm sorry. It's machine learning. So it's a machine learning engine, and it has a it has a lot of interesting features. It has a it has a feature called attention. So that means it, it knows what concepts, you know, what lexicons are important throughout you know a piece of text. So it has a similar concept, you know, that rifles you know, our you know, so-called attention. Um, so you know, I, I I only spent like an hour to to read it, you know, but it was enough to convince me that. In, uh, in 18 months, in two years or so, uh, the model itself is going to be fine. They will find more data to train it. And then also the, um, what they call the, uh, the transformer, you know, which is the generative part of the chat VPT, they will also enhance that side too. So I think we, we, we're going to see some you know, enhancement definitely in 18 months because there will also be competition from Google, Microsoft, and, you know, all the other you know, tech giants that you already know. Yeah. I was just going to say that, um, at least to my understanding, I think the reason that it could be generating this logic or seem to have logic is because when we do thought, oftentimes we do thought through words. When you write something, you're thinking in a way. And so, um, basically, by taking that input, since it's a text predictive algorithm, mm -hmm. right, it's taking and, and because it can reference back to things that it's previously said, yes. it can then draw those connections mm -hmm. and then. By generally human logic, say, you know, based on this logic, I can predict the next thing. That's like what it was built to. It was yes. built to follow logic, just to follow. And since words carry all of our logic, mm -hmm. they can do the rest. That is true, you know, but I think by the time it can also be, you know, mathematical equation, that will also increase its capability of reasoning because mathematical notations. Are far more precise. Yes, better you know, words. Yeah, they're they're much more structured, and you cannot have confusion or ambiguation. So you know, I, I think we are going to look at you know a much better you know chat GPT in about two years. You know, because the competition is going to push it too. You know, Google is already working really hard on their own you know chat GPT engine. Um, other countries, entire countries, are backing up their own you know engine to do about the same thing. So, uh, so this will be very interesting. I think it's going to be very, very interesting. You know, in the next two, four, six years or so, you know, how this is going to evolve. You know, just based on what I can see now, you know, I think you, it, it can learn your know, reasoning just by reading. You know, without actual, you know, um, without hard coding. Yeah. Well, it depends on what data is used to train it. I mean, you know, people can use it for a lot of malicious purposes. You know, I can totally see you know, lots of malicious applications. Um, open AI you know, was trying to be uh, ethical, you know, in terms of you know, filtering, you know, things that they think is inappropriate to train their chat GPT on. Um, but you know, some other countries you know may not feel the same way, right? I mean, you know, they might want to train you know chat you know their own you know GPT engine to uh, spread you know news that are not true, you know things like that. Yep. 
Yes. Yes. So, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say on the right side, uh, it sounds like it needs a lot of profit and power. So, we don't got to worry about typical people using it for bad. I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I, do, I, I don't know about that because because what ChatGPT is, is, it's basically a modeler of everything that is in text in the entire humanity, in the, in the entire internet. Uh, if, if I read about it, it's close to one terabyte of you know, compressed text information that it was trained on. Um, so it understands, okay, well, I shouldn't say it understands, but it can model human behavior. Okay, you know, if you describe, you know, this is what happens, this is what next, what's going to happen next, and this is what happened next, it will help, it can actually go ahead and predict what's, what that person is going to do next, or the possibilities, you know, just because, you know, we have enough text description of human behavior, and it can basically just, it's a predictive network, you know, that has been trained to handle this sort of stuff. So, yeah, so it, I think it's going to be very interesting in the near future. All right, so we are going to get back to some of the kind of boring stuff here. Um, <laughs> but the thing is, you know, even though you know, ChatGPT can output things, um, it still contains error. So it will still be advantageous for humans to understand the content and be able to evaluate, to be able to you know, problem, you know, uh, troubleshoot, and also to you know, um, you know, find out whether the output from the data is valid or not. So, you know, it's still important for us to understand all the basic stuff because we don't want to just ask the chat, chat DVD to do something and trust it at 0%, you know, it may not be right at the percent All right, so we're getting back to congruent module, okay, which is basically just the idea of, you know, A and B are considered a congruent module N as long as A can be expressed as, you know, B times KA uh, B plus KA times N, and B can be expressed as B plus KD times N. N itself, you know, is kind of an integer. Uh, KA and KD can be positive or negative integers, and then B should also be an integer, but it should be between zero and N minus one. Okay, so that's what we talked about last time. Remember the clock thing? Okay, so basically, you know, as long as the value lands on the same spot on the clock face. How many times you have to turn the hand before you end up there does not matter. Is that okay? All right, cool. So obviously, you know, when the question is whether three or 19 are supposed to be the same in, you know, uh, when we have congruent module 16, that's a silly question. Okay, you know, why would we want to you know, use the same representation for three and 19? 19 is out of range. On the other hand, we do want to represent negative values. So this is a table to give you an idea of, you know, if we make B from zero to 15, okay, which is the first column, and then we make K of A a zero, which means we are not multiplying B by any multiples of 16 in this case, then A is just gonna go from zero to 15, okay? That's easy. Because without, you know, well, I shouldn't say without, but with KA being zero, B and A will be the same according to the equation. But what if KB is negative one? Then B is going to be negative 16 all the way to negative one, just based on how we define A and B in terms of B, KA, KB, and N. So we still do okay so far with this table here. Okay? So we're not going to use up all of these bit patterns because when you look at B, each one is representing a bit pattern, you know, four bits. Zero is zero, 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 zero. One is zero, 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 one. And I'm just going to skip all the way to 11. 11 is going to be one, zero, one, one. And then skip all the way to 15, which is one, 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 one. So every row is corresponding to one unique four bit pattern. So now we are saying, hmm, so for certain yeah, bit patterns like this one here, which is 1011, we can use it to represent 11, or also we can use it to represent 
negative five. So we don't want to use all negative numbers. Do you want to have a signed integer where you cannot represent non-negative values? That probably is not going to be very useful, right? So I think it kind of makes sense that we want that maybe one half of it to be non-negative values and the other half be negative values. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So where's the midpoint? Well, the midpoint is right about here. So we can use the zero to <coughs> seven to actually just represent zero to seven. But the big pattern that is also used to represent eight will now be used to represent negative eight, negative seven, all the way to negative one. So we are going to break it up into two halves. Okay, we break the table into two halves. One half is going to represent zero to seven, and the other half is going to represent negative one to negative eight. Is that okay? You know, I'm just talking about how we are going to partition this table so that we use one one half of it for non-negative values and then the other half for negative values. Is that part okay? All right. Okay, so if that one is okay, then you know, we are going to come up with you know, the ranges. So the ranges is figure out like this. If you use W bit you know, for your integers, so in this particular table, W equals to four because we're using four bits, okay? So if we're using W as the number of bits or the width, that's why we use W, it's the width of an integer, then the range of unsigned is easy. It's just zero to two to the power of W, the whole thing minus one. And that one is pretty easy. So in the case that W is four, then it is from zero to 15, which is what we saw in the table. Is that okay for unsigned? For signed, on the other hand, we have you know, the range is going to go from negative two to the power of W minus one. So the W minus one, the entire thing, is the exponent of two. And then that whole thing is that's the most negative value. And then two, two to the power of the entire thing, W minus one, then that the entire thing minus one. So when W is four, then the most negative value is negative two to the power of three, which is negative eight. The most positive value is going to be two to the power of three, which is eight minus one, which is seven. So that kind of corresponds to what we talked about earlier of partitioning that table. So the one half is what we use for non-negative values, and then the other half will be for negative values. So we're still okay at this point about you know, how we are assigning the bit patterns to the value that we want them to represent. So we're good so far? All right. So now we're gonna move on again to talk about arithmetic negation. So in terms of arithmetic negation, the first thing we want to do is to review what is um, congruent modulo n, okay? This is just a you know, special case of what we had before. Uh, B is some kind of value. So the arithmetic negation of B is congruent modulo n to the negation of B plus K times N. Okay, that kind of goes without saying, right? Because, you know, we just, you know, in the earliest slide, we just go like, okay, you know, if these two sides, they just have to be different by some multiple of N. This is clearly one of those cases. Is that okay? All right. So now we're gonna go through some derivations and, you know, I hope you guys will you know, pay some attention in the derivation because once you know the derivation, um, the actual um, operation to do this, you know, it be, it's very easy to explain. So I'm just, I will try to explain this kind of step by step. So we'll, we'll start with the negation of B. So B is some kind of value. Okay, we don't know what it is. Uh, we just say, well, we want to find out, you know, what else you know, can the big patterns that represent negative B will also be represented. That's basically what we are asking. So this is congruent modulo n to negative B plus n. So is this part okay up to here? Is that just like the, the unit circle? Huh? 
Is that just like the unit circle where it's like the same value regardless of yes. like how many times you go? Yeah, so this plus n here is basically the clock hand going one full revolution in the positive direction, but it still ends up at the same spot. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So that is that part okay? You know, up to just here. The first part. Okay. So now we go from here to here. So is this part and this part okay? And note that I'm not using congruent modulo n anymore. Uh, this is an actual equality. But does that make sense to you? It not, not only should it, well, okay. So there's, there are two things. One is, do you understand why there's an equality? And I think that's pretty easy to see because there's a plus one and then there's a subtraction of one. Obviously they cancel out each other. So, but does it make sense? May not, it may not make sense to you. It's like, why are you making things more complicated than it needs to be? Right, because you know, before it's kind of easier. Now, why, why do I even bother to say, okay, let's take n minus one and then add one back to it. Why not just say n? So moving on to the next one, this equality here. So we're moving on to the next equality, which is this one here. So are we okay with the left-hand side of the equality where the mouse cursor is on versus the right-hand side? Can we? Are you guys convinced that this equality holds? Okay, that's algebra, right? So we are just moving things around just a little bit. And what is the significance? I mean, this is not an algebra class, right? And this is probably before algebra two in terms of the, the type of operation. So we're not quite sure, okay, at this point, why that is significant. So all we can now say is, the arithmetic negation of B is congruent module N with N minus one, the whole thing, minus B, that whole thing, plus one. It's like, okay, you know, this is something middle schoolers can do. So now the question is, what is N? So N is some power of two, you know, because we're dealing with binary numbers, you know, all the numbers inside the computer of binary because they're either a zero or a one. So that means n is a power of two for some integer w that is greater than zero. So more typically, w is eight, 16, 32, 64, and so on. Okay, you know, those are natural word size within the processor itself. So now if we make that assumption that n is indeed a power of two, then you do the substitution. So the negation of E is congruent modulo to two to the power of W because we have N equals to two to the power of W. Then we have two to the power of W minus one, that entire thing minus E, and then that entire thing plus one. You go like, I don't see what is the big deal, right? So the big deal here is, can you guess what is the binary represent representation of two to the power of W? Minus one. So just try out, you know, let's say W equals to four. Okay. So what is two to the power of four minus one? Yes. It is uh however many bits it is, all set as one. They're all ones, exactly. Hmm. Okay. So now we have two to the power of W minus one. You know, this whole thing is represented by W consecutive ones. Okay, the entire integer are consisting of just ones. So when w is four, we have one, 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 which is one plus two plus four plus eight, adding up to 15. When w equals to eight, then we have one plus two plus four plus eight plus 16 plus 32 plus 64 plus 128, which adds up to 255, which is 256, is that to the power that two to the power of eight minus one? Okay, so why is that significant? Well, it is significant because when you subtract a bit pattern from one, 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 you know, the entire thing is one, you are just negate, negating it. Let me say that one more time. Okay, so whatever B is, okay, I don't care what it is, okay, whatever B is, it is represented by a bit pattern. 
when you do a binary subtraction of whatever V is from one, 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 you know, all ones, you are basically doing a, a logical negation of every single bit of V itself. Okay, so first of all, I'll be understanding the sentence, not so much you know, that, yes, that makes sense. Okay, whether it makes sense or not, we'll, we'll deal with that later. But do we understand what I just said? Okay, so we, we, can, we can work out a few examples. So we'll go ahead and take a look at, you know, some concrete examples here. And let me uh, get rid of the windows that do not need to be here. Okay, so we'll go ahead and take a look at, you know, let's say uh, W equals to four and we want V equals to, okay, we'll try something, you know, mild, which is five in this case. And then we want to figure out, you know, what it means when we are performing that math here. So now we say, you know, negative V is, um, you know, I'm not sure whether I should use, you know, um, I'm going to use this symbol here to, you know, to, to make it the same thing as congruent modulo 16, because I can't really, unless you guys want to me to use equations, you know, which way do you want me to do? Is this way okay? Or do you want me to use the actual equation type thing? Nope, this is fine. Okay. So now we're going to say, oh, this is according to what we said earlier, this is the same thing as 16, the whole thing minus one, and then that whole thing minus V. Yes, go ahead. So you're saying using the equation label sign or the zero sign? Say that one more time. Like you're asking if uh, you want us to use the equal sign? Okay, let me let me make it clear here. Okay, this is the same as with I think underscore sixteen. Yep, there you go. Okay. No, so no. <laughs> what? You like the equation? Yeah. Fine, we'll do the equation. That's called congruent between them. You should. I'll just I'll just be blunt and say you should because that's what we talked about on Tuesday. Yep, got it. Stay on top of the topics. All right. So is that part okay? So now we do the calculation, right? So the calculation goes like. Um, so I'm just gonna start a new one. 16 minus one is 15, right? And then 15 is represented as one, 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 one in base two. And I don't need these parentheses anymore. You can focus on just the, the right-hand side. Is that okay? So my claim now is whatever V is, I'm just you know, taking a, a bitwise knot of the whole thing. Okay. So now we're gonna say, okay, let's try out you know, V equals to five. So if V equals to five, then it is also known as um, zero, one, zero, one in base two. So now you know, if I go back to this equation here, this is what we're trying to do. Zero, one, zero, one, base two. So the question now is, um, Tack claims that this whole thing is just a bitwise knot of zero, one, zero, one. What is a bitwise knot? A bitwise knot is really the same thing as a multi-bit knot gate in logic. Every bit is negated. So the result of the gate, um, each bit of the result of the gate corresponds to the logical knot of the same bit position of the input. Okay, that's like a little wordy to describe. All right, but are you convinced? Because what we have one minus one, which is a zero. Then we have a one minus zero, which is a one. Then we have a one minus one again, which is a zero. We have one minus zero, which is all zero one. So the claim that one minus whatever bit is really just the negation of that bit. What would be a good technique to prove that? I mean, some of you should be really tired of that phrase now. Sure. <laughs> true table again. True table again. Yes, 
Absolutely. So how do we make that truth table? So this is you know, basically a technique uh, or I'm hinting, okay, you know, if I just claim something, how do you prove it to yourself? How do you say, okay, have we learned the technique to prove this to myself? So I'm just you know, trying to show you how to do this. Do you have a question? Nope, okay. All right, so we're gonna make a table uh, where X is a bit, and then we have one minus X, and then we also have just the negation of X here. And then we'll turn this into a table like that. X, because it's a single bit, it can be a zero or it can be a one. So when X is a zero, one minus X is obviously a one, but the negation of zero is also a one. When X is a one, one minus one is a zero, but the negation of one is also a zero. Oh, cool. That is pretty cool. Because it, it means, hey, if, you, if I know that you're subtracting a bit, okay, a zero or one from one itself, I don't have to do this as an arithmetic operation. I can now do this as a bitwise operation. Okay, it's just a logical knot of X. Is that okay? Yeah. So one minus x is not x. When, if and only if x is a binary digit, yes. A binary digit is a bit, by definition. That's why it is called a bit because it starts with a b and it ends with it. Is that okay? All right. So, okay, getting back to here, what does that mean? Hmm. Well, what that means is instead of doing this subtraction here, I can now just use this utility symbol. And it doesn't work because the utility symbol has a particular meaning and that doesn't work either. Um, I just have to use a bitwise knot. Okay, how about this? I call this C1, a one's complement. So one's complement is also known as bitwise knot. It is just flipping the bits, okay? One becomes zero, zero become one. Are we still doing okay so far with this? Okay, so one complement by definition is bitwise knot. And bit, there is a bitwise knot operator in C++. Which one is it? I really need to play that tune, the, the Jeopardy tune. Dum, 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 dum. Okay, so which operator in C++ does bitwise not? Is the tilde, huh? Nope. The exclamation mark is a logical knot, but the bitwise knot is the tilde symbol. It's tilde. So, which is a shift back take on your keyboard. So, I mean, just I, I'll make it clear you know, uh, C1 of X is the same as tilde X. In C and C++. Yep. If you want to put the tilde, it's backslash S I N plus C. Okay. Yep. So hmm, that is kind of cool. So now I have to give you another you know, representation. This whole thing is now known as C2, which is two's complement of 0, 1, 0, 1 in base 2. In other words, C2 of X is the same as C1 of X plus one, which is the bitwise knot of X plus one. Are we doing okay so far with this? I can you know, finish this example. Okay, so let's go ahead and finish this example. So what do we end up with? So we end up with 1010 zero, zero in base two plus one, which is 1011 one, one in base two. So now the question is, um, are we really sure about this? Are we really sure that the uh, arithmetic negation of five is whatever this thing is representing? One, zero, one, one. So let's, let's, let's look up that table, okay? Because that table has all the uh, values you know, that we want to represent, what we want to be able to represent. So we switch back to the slide. And then we go back to the table and look up 1011, which is you know, what we know as 11. It is indeed negative 5. 
So I'm going to pause here and see if there are any questions because you know uh, we kind of work on this a little bit fast. So I want to see if there are any questions about what just happened. How about another example? Yes. Um, I was, I don't know, it was a lot for, you know, like, I don't know really, uh, it was just kind of what we're living in. <laughs> <laughs> okay. you, can, you can say that. Yeah. I'll, I'll try, I'll try my best to clarify. <laughs> no worries. Okay, so we are we're trying to find out how to do arithmetic negation, but only when we are representing negative numbers in what we call two subgroups. Okay, you know, this is well, I should say that when we are using a uh, congruent modulo you know, two to the power of w as a method to get to the, the negative side. Yep. So a conversion. Or... It's not so much a conversion. It is trying to figure out. You know what? If I have a bit pattern of a certain value, what is the bit pattern of the arithmetic negation of that particular value? That's basically what two's complement is trying to do. Two's complement eventually becomes the same thing as arithmetic negation. Yep. Uh, do you have to set it up like on this computer to recognize those as negative values? No. Nope. Your signed integer automatically does this. All right. So I think we can go through a few examples, right? So give me a negative value between negative one and negative eight. Well, okay, between negative one and negative seven, because eight is out is going to be out of range. So give me a negative value between negative one and negative seven, and I'll show you how to go the opposite way to find out what is the positive version of that negative value. Just negative pick one. Five. Hmm? Negative five. Negative five? Yeah. But that's no fun. We just did that. Oh. <laughs> no, we didn't we didn't do that. We did we did not do that. Let's do negative five. Okay. So if you look at negative five is here and it is represented by the bit pattern of one zero one one. Is that part okay? According to this table, negative five is represented by the bit pattern of one zero one one. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. So now what we do is we go back to Joplin, and then this time, you know, I'm gonna show you the equation as well, okay? So V equals to negative five, which is you know, represented by one zero one one in base two. Is that okay? Because that's just you know, from the table of that. So what we wanna do is to find, okay, if I take the arithmetic negation of negative five, what would that look like? Okay, that's that's what we're trying to find out. So we'll go ahead and say negative v is the same thing as the two's complement of v, which is the one's complement of v plus one, which is now the one's complement of one zero one one in base two plus one, which is now equal to um, uh, bitwise not right you know, of one zero one one. Okay, let me pause here so that you guys have a chance to do it. What is the bitwise knot of the bit pattern of one zero one one? You just put all the ones to zeros, all the zeros to ones. What does it mean? Zero, 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 one, zero, zero. Okay, very good. Okay, so because you, you're just putting the bits you know, by position. Okay, so the ones complement is becoming zero, one, zero, zero in base two plus one. And there's no carrying in this one, okay? Zero, one, zero, zero in base two plus one. What is the result? Zero, zero, one. Zero, one, zero, one, okay. So now we are asking, what is that equal to in congruent modulo 16 in that table? It is five. So we got it back. And just to confirm, you could, if you ran it on zero one zero one, you would get one zero one one back out. Correct. When you when you apply two's complement to zero one zero one, then you end up with one zero one one in base two. All right. Well, this is kind of fun, but let me try something stupid. Yeah, because things that seems to be stupid most of the time are the boundary cases. 
And boundary cases are always interesting to test. Yep. So this is the average one This is the same thing as one's complement. <laughs> we are doing one's complement. That's what one's complement is here. Because two's complement is defined to be one's complement plus one. That's how it is defined. Two's complement is by definition one's complement of the bit pattern plus one. Okay. So that's what we're doing here. So we're saying, okay, arithmetic negation is supposed to be the same as two's complement of the same thing. So now, you know, two's complement becomes one's complement of that value of the bit pattern plus one. So that becomes, you know, you know, I'm just substituting G in here. B is one zero one one because we found that negative five is carbon of one zero one one. I thought we were trying to get to the right. I didn't think I, I didn't know we were trying to get to the right. Eleven turns out to have the same representation as negative five, but if we're using the sign interpretation. Then 11 is out. We do not recognize 11 as a value anymore. We only recognize negative 5 as a value when we decide to look at the big pattern as a uh, signed entity. So it's an interpretation. If we have to choose which interpretation we want to use. Are we? Yep. Yeah, so if I add uh, 0, 1, 0, 1 with uh, one zero one one, I will get zero since it's five plus one five. That's a very good conjecture. It is a conjecture that you can verify yourself. Okay. okay, so I'm not trying to mean here because I do want you to exercise what you have learned already. So I would encourage you guys to do the binary addition of zero one zero one and one zero one one and see whether you end up with zeros. Or do you guys want me to do it? <laughs> okay, I see. You guys want me to do it. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead and do that one. I'm just trying to decide here what is the best way to do it. A spreadsheet is easier because it's already a table. I don't have to go through the table formatting stuff. So I'm going to use a you know just a regular spreadsheet to do this, and I'm going to use a spreadsheet app that's running on my computer, you know, just so that I don't have to you know go to a Google Sheet to do the same thing. All right, so let's go ahead and string some columns. There we go. All right, so we'll have we have zero one zero one, and we are adding this time to one. Oops. Okay, this is adding. We are adding it to one zero. Okay, not not. Okay. Yeah, yep, because it's seeing the uh, the yeah. plus as the beginning of a formula. Um. All right. So we are adding it to one zero one one. All right. So this row is the Q row. So this is going to be a zero. This is going to be a one. This is going to be a one. And this is going to be a one because we are not stacking addition. So K zero is by default a zero. And then this one is going to be a one because we have X equals to one, Y equals to one. So there's a carry of one. This is going to be a one because we have um, Q one being a one, K one is also a one contributing a carry of one to K2. This is not going, this is also going to be a one for the same reason, because K2 is a one. Uh, Q2 is also a one, so K3 is going to be a one. And then we also have a one over here. And there's another addition here. And now you just have to add up you know, the Q and the K. Oh, by the way, <laughs> because I just remember, you know, oh, Q, K relating to the, to the S. How are they related? The majority of the class got this in the lab, but a few people did not. 
So I just want to double check, okay? How do we get to the sum bit from the Q and the K bits? Exclusive or, not an AND, okay? Several people use an AND gate instead of an exclusive OR gate. All right, so this is exclusive OR. So this is a zero, 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 zero. So there you go, you got your zero. But this, yeah. okay. Yeah. <clears throat> So let me get back to what I was you know, trying to do earlier, which is also seemingly stupid, but it's actually a, a good exercise, okay? Because what seems to be stupid, most of the time is because, you know, why would you want to do something like that? It seems stupid, but it's actually um, useful because, you know, we are actually trying some boundary cases here. Yes? With that last example, if it was the unsigned, um, would it be you, a you do not apply you know, two's complement to unsigned integers. Or I should say, if a bit pattern is interpreted unsigned, then two's complement makes no sense at all. Well, I mean, with the addition. With the like, addition? Which one? Adding the two different binary ones. Addition is sign agnostic. Could it be zero and also 16 now? All right, so let's <coughs> switch back to the addition. You're, you're referring to this addition here, right? Yeah. That the carry of one there. Yes. So it depends on how you want to interpret the bit patterns. If you choose to interpret the bit patterns as unsigned, then you have five plus 11, which is supposed to be a 16. But because your sum only has six bits, I mean, four bits, it can only represent a zero. But with this overall of the overall carry of one is representing a carry of 16. So you're correct but you have to be consistent. You know, X, Y, and sum, they all have to be interpreted in the same way. So you cannot say, oh, X is signed, Y is unsigned, and then you know, the sum is signed again. That would not work. Mm -hmm. That's a good observation. So let me switch back to uh, Joplin. Okay, so this time I'm using B equal to zero. Okay, that should make it very easy, right? Because zero, 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 zero goes here. And then the bitwise knot of zero, zero, zero is what? One 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 plus one is zero 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 zero, which is zero. So that works. the The two's complement of zero is zero, but the arithmetic negation of zero is also zero. So it's consistent. Yep. For these sort of questions, we don't even worry about the carries. That is correct because we only we only want the sum. And the sum, the width of the sum has to be the same as the original number. So that's why we only focus on the least significant four digits. Yep. We good now. All right. So now that we understand, you know, how a negative number is represented and how we uh, do the arithmetic negation. Let's see if we can find a handy way to look at the bit pattern and find out what is the value interpreted signed of that bit pattern. Okay, so we'll go ahead and try out a few examples first. Okay, so so given okay, uh, let me scroll down first. So given w equals to okay, let's let's pick four again. Um, what is the value, the signed value represented by a number x? That is the question. All right. So if it's unsigned, we know what the answer is. So let me go back to the unsigned first, and then we'll work with the sign. Okay. So we'll uh, repeat the same question. Oops. And then we'll ask the question of what is the unsigned value? Because we have seen this one already. So the unsigned value represented by the, by, by the number is basically the summation where I goes from zero to in this case, W minus one, which is three. And what we are adding in each term is two, oops, excuse me, d digit I times two, to the power of i. All right. Does that look uh, 
faintly familiar to you because it should. When we talked about base conversion, that's what we saw, okay? Except we had a more general B for base, but in this case, we're dealing with base two, so B is two. Are we good so far? All right. So now, if we are dealing with signed, so let's let's check out how this works, okay? So we'll say, you know, what if X equals to one zero one one in base two, because we talked about this quite a bit, right? So this is now, you know, one plus two plus eight, and it boils down to, you know, this is 11 in base 10. So we got that already, not a problem. So now we want to answer this other question, which is what if we want to use the signed interpretation? Same bit pattern, but we want to look at it from the signed perspective. So as it turns out, it is almost like unsigned, except for the interpretation of one bit, okay? So I'll give you the equation first, and then you guys will tell me, you know, whether it makes sense or not. So the equation is almost the same, okay? We do a summation where i equals to zero, but it only goes all the way up to two in this case, it's w minus two. Um, and it's the same thing, you know, digit i times two to the power of i, oops, right here. And then we have one extra subtraction here, of d3 times two, oops, two to the power of three. All right. So this is also specific to w equals to four, and I'm giving you this closed form equation here, which is um, the signed interpretation of the bit pattern of x, of, a, of, a, of x. So all the di are basically digits of x. All right, fine. Let's make it more consistent. So we'll make it, we'll make this more consistent by using x to refer to the digits of x, and the same thing over here. There we go. So just to make it more consistent. So the question is, um, does that work? So if I apply this equation to one zero one one, what what are we supposed to get? So this part here, you still have the one and the two, which adds up to three. Right? Professor, that's yes. huh? I mean, X, X, I or X1? I can't see. X, I. Thank you. Yep, X of I. Is that okay? So, so the first part, which is the sigma, will give us one of one, one of two, none of four. And that's it. That's all the sigma is going to give us. And then we have to subtract X3. So in this case, x3 is a one. So x3 is a one times two to the power of three. So we end up with the subtraction of eight. So we have three minus eight, which is negative five. So it does work out. So there is, so in general, how do we do this? So now we just work out the one specific example. So in general, if you just want to deal with w, then you replace this with W minus one, you replace this with W minus two, and then you replace this one with W minus one, and also this one here with W minus one. So I'm giving you the most general form of how to interpret a bit pattern, either signed or unsigned, yes. So does the first digit just indicate if it's negative or positive? Yes. Okay. That's a very good observation. I would not call it the first digit. If you want to call the first digit, you have to say the first digit from the left. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Because you know, when, when, when people look at this big pattern here and you see the first digit, the if you're if you're referring to the least significant digit, it's going to be this one. But if you're referring to the most significant digit, it's going to be this one. But you meant from that to most digit, which is also known as the most significant digit or MSP. Okay. All right. But what you said is actually quite profound. Okay. Let me repeat what you just said. You said the most significant bit, okay, is indicating whether the number is, is negative or not. Hmm. So does that mean even if all the other bits 
other than the most significantly, but every single other bit is a one, they cannot counteract that negative eight because that's what you imply, right? And the answer is yes, okay? The answer is yes. If the most significant bit is a one, you can have every all the, all the other bits being a one and they would not be enough to counteract that one most significant bit. And the whole number, the value of the entire number still ends up negative. But let's try this out, okay, with only four bits. So let's, you know, I'll, I'll make it very clear so that we know what we're dealing with. So let's take a look at one, 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 one in base two. And we want the signed interpretation. So what do we end up with? We end up with one plus two plus four for the three less significant digits because we have this one of one, one of two, one of four, add those up together. But we have this one over here because so we have to subtract the eight from the whole thing. So this thing minus eight is barely negative, but it is negative. So now we have problem for face uh, for four digits when W equals to four, this claim is true. The question is, can you prove that regardless of W, it is also true. Whenever the most significant digit is a one, the value being represented when we choose to interpret signed is also going to be negative, guaranteed. So if you have taken CISP 440, you can actually use proof by induction to this one, which is actually pretty easy to do. Um, but I'm not going to talk about proof by induction in this class. I'm just going to tell you that yes, the most significant bit actually determines whether the signed value is negative or not. Can you guess then? So thank you for that prompt because now I can actually give a specific name to the most significant digit. Can someone guess what is the other name of the most significant digit? It is also called the what bit? The sign bit, exactly. Because that alone would determine whether the signed value being represented is negative or not. If the most significant bit is a one, doesn't matter what the other bits are, the value is guaranteed to be negative. If the most significant bit is a zero, then the value has to be non-negative. Yep. I don't, I don't know if you already said it, but what I was just practicing a few of the choose complement on numbers. Mm -hmm. I noticed that if you do one zero zero zero, you don't get like a different number, you just get one zero zero. That is correct. So that's why it is a problem because one zero 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 is designated only as negative eight. And the reason why you, you have a problem like this is because positive eight is not within the range of a four bit signed integer. So you basically have an out of range problem here. So very good. Okay, so that's a very good observation. Two, the two's complement of one zero 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 is also one zero zero zero, but in that case, it is an overflow situation because eight is not representable as a value when you only have four bits and you choose to interpret using the signed interpretation. Is that okay? All right. All right, so I think we are moving along pretty good here. And moving down. And this is this is basically just what I said you know, earlier. Um, in fact, for each bit digit in this special case. So this is a proof, okay? This is a proof that um, D equals to the negation or the bitwise not of Y. Um, that's basically the same thing that we did earlier, uh, which we did using the truth table. Okay, so that's basically corresponding to proof table proof. And then when we move on, it is really just defining what is two's complement. So we define right here, we define two's complement of a bit pattern X to be the one's complement of bit pattern X plus one. Two's complement is still also the same thing as bitwise not like that. 
Are we doing okay so far with this? All right. So now the section four is going back to the question that I asked earlier on Tuesday, which is, you know, if I just look at the big pattern, is it 13 or is it negative three? In this case, we're looking at 1101. And once again, the answer is, why do you care? Are you in a context where it matters? Most of the time, it is not, unless you're comparing. So comparison is the only scenario where you really want to decide, do I want to look at this as 13 or do I want to look at this as negative three? If you're adding, it doesn't matter. If you're subtracting, it doesn't matter. The only time it matters is when you're comparing. Are we doing okay so far with this? So let's go through a few calculations to see whether, you know, the, the, whether it's signed or not does not make any difference. Yep, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Like greater than or equal to comparing? Yeah, less than, greater than. I mean, equal to doesn't care. Okay, equal to is really just saying, do we have exactly the same zeros and ones at those positions? So in that case, well, 13 or negative three doesn't make a difference, okay? So when you want to know whether one is less than or greater than the other one, then it does matter. So we're gonna go through some calculations here. Okay, since I got to stretch it up anyway, might as well do it. So now oh, we can just use this as an example, okay? So if I choose to use the unsigned representation, 0101 0, 1, 0, 1 is five, 1011 1, 1 is 11. And then this is a zero, but it has a carry of 16. So we still end up with 16. But if we choose to use a signed interpretation, this is five, this is negative five, and then we have a zero here because you know in this case the carry has no meaning, so we still end up with the correct result. So whether you interpret those values as signed versus unsigned, it doesn't change how we add or subtract. And this is the best part of why we choose this method to represent negative value because we don't need dedicated subtractors or adders because we just use exactly the same adder that we have been talking about. How do you, uh, between uh, signed and unsigned, like how are you interpreting? That would be determined by the programmer. In other words, you know, when you write a program, just like when you write a C program, like you, you have, like a variable we don't have that, we don't have a type in assembly language programming. So, you know, when you, need to know whether it's signed or not, which is usually the result of comparing, you, at that point, you have to choose a different way of, of looking at the result of the comparison, which, I, you know, which we haven't talked about yet, okay? So it has to do with the flags, you know, that we have not talked about yet. Yep. Which one's signed and which one's unsigned? You mean between yeah. column H and column I? Yes. Okay. I would encourage you to think about this, but I will help you. I will guide you in this process. So what does it mean when we say signed versus unsigned? So what is the difference of a signed integer versus an unsigned integer? Signed has to be negative. Signed can represent negative values, but unsigned cannot, right? Unsigned, you know, they all have to be non-negative. Very good. Yep. What do you mean by can represent? Well, because you can, I mean, okay, so let's take a 16 bit signed integer. <coughs> can I represent one using a 16 bit signed integer? Yeah. Yeah. So the value being represented by a signed integer doesn't have to be negative. It's just that it can represent negative one, but doesn't mean that negative values are the only ones you can represent. So that's what it is. All right, so given that particular clue, I'm going to get back to your question. So which column do you think is the signed interpretation and which column do you think is the unsigned interpretation? I mean, the I column is signed and the H column is also signed. That is right, because your column I is the one that has a negative value in it, which is basically implying that that is the signed interpretation because unsigned interpretation cannot go negative. So 
when you're um, when you declare your integer mm -hmm. as just a regular integer, mm -hmm. you know, not signed, you have to make sure that there's no, nowhere down the road you're going to be a greater than or a less than. Mm. I'm not sure what you mean by when I was learning when I was about this, I was like, why is this why is this one sign and how come this one's okay? But it's not but it's not sign. So like let's say like in your let's say in your function or whatever, mm -hmm. it's just addition. And you and you say it's okay. uh, that's an integer, but then your function feeds into this other function, mm -hmm. but then there's a comparison in that function and you that one where you instantiated it. Just an integer and not a signed integer, then you're screwed and it feeds into that second. All right, so let me see if I can use a um, sample program to illustrate what you're, 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 you're expressing. Okay, so we'll go ahead and write a sample program. So we'll go take a look at uh, simple.c. And this is, a, this is one thing I try to get people to use is standard integer.h. So this header file allows you to specify what is the width of your integers. So it can only be 8, 16, 32, and 64, but it really helps, okay? Because you, you really want to know what is the range of value that your variable can represent. So I'm going to have int main, and we'll have int x and y here, okay? So I'm going to say, you know, initialize x to 2, and we'll initialize y to negative three, okay? And we'll do something stupid again, right? If x is less than y, um, actually in this case, I'm gonna say if x is greater than y, then we say, that's right, okay? And otherwise, we say, as you guys said, that's messed up. There we go. Return zero. Okay. So, can, can we predict the output of this program? Yes. Okay. Now, I, I used the you know, in, uh, standard integer dot h, but I did not actually end up using it. So, I'm going to say, you know, int um, h underscore t, which is, you know, basically making sure that I'm using a bit integers in this case. Okay, now this is really useful. Okay, I, I'll tell you one, I'll, I'll give you one example of why this is really, really important. But before that, let me check the time. Okay, so we, we still got time. Um, I wrote uh, robotic or motion control code before. And part of that, you know, has to do with the square of the displacement, which can turn out to be a relatively large number. So when I dry tested the code on a PC, Everything worked, okay? You know, not a problem. So then I transplanted that code onto a uh, onto an Arduino platform, and for short distances, no problem. But as soon as I tried to get further away, it just totally messed up. So as it turns out, int on my PC is by default thirty-two bit wide, and then on the Arduino, which is also using C plus plus as a programming language but the default width of an int is 16 bit. So I ran out of range when I transplanted exactly the same code from the PC to the Arduino. If I had chosen to say, hmm, based on the displacement that I have to deal with, the square of the displacement will need a 32 bit integer, and I just insist every single time to say int 32 underscore t, I would not have that problem. So I just want to give you an example of why it is useful in many cases to specify the width of your integers. Um, you know. But in this case, it's not nearly as important. So I'm going to run this program because you, know, you guys will probably know what it's supposed to output. So gc3 dash u dash d dash o simple, simple. F dot c. Oh, that's g, not dash d. There we go. All right, because you know, I didn't include a standard io.h. SDDIO.h. There we go. Try again. Run it. It says that's right. Everything is good. All right. So 
I can mess up this program just by saying, you know, I know better. This is supposed to be an unsigned integer. So this is a type cast operator. I hope you guys do remember what is a static cast. Now I know, you know, if you're coming from Kakashan CL class, you're supposed to say your static cast angle bracket, blah, 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 and then in parentheses. But this is plain C. This is not C++, okay? So this is a little bit more primitive. That's what we do when we do typecasting. Okay. So when we run this code, even though X had a side interpretation by default, because we chose to tell the compiler and say, hey, this X and this Y here, they're supposed to be signed. But the typecast operator is basically you telling the compiler and go like, I know what I'm doing. Just go ahead and interpret these things as unsigned. So X becomes, you know, so that we are choosing to interpret the bit pattern of X in an unsigned way, same thing for Y. So now we're gonna run the same program with a type casting and see what happens. It's messed up because of I change the interpretation of the bit pattern. It's the same bit pattern, but because I choose to interpret the bit pattern in a different way, the values become different. Yep. In this case, is it taking the negative and making it positive? Yes. So the negative becomes a relatively large positive. Um, so was it negative two? Negative three would be the same as 253. So negative three and 253 have the same representation when you only have eight bits. All right. Okay, so I'm going to take row. Okay, you guys know that you know, I will take row occasionally. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I was just coming out of a... Uh, Academic standard meeting, and they are now questioning, you know, well, should we really take row and so on? So. All right, so I got the time set up already, but it's already passed, so I'm gonna have to change that time to 6 50 p.m. There we go. Save and publish. All right, so, oh, that is not good. I thought it would display this whole thing. Okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, but the access code is C2. You need to know that first. So C2 lowercase is the access code, and this is the QR code. Lowercase C2. Many of my colleagues are still completely in the dark and not know anything about chat GPT. They're still you're going like, oh yeah, online asynchronous classes, those are the best, man. <laughs> wow, suddenly all my students be are becoming you know, top rated writers. <laughs> Give them any topic, they can crank out you know, all of these fantastic articles. Hmm? Yep. <laughs> So clearly, because they just point out because they're calling the students very much that, right? They can, they can keep drinking coffee, right? You know? yeah. That must be it. Or, or whatever stimulant of choice. <laughs> there we go. So I'll be good here with uh, the taking row thingy. Okay. All right. Cool. So the next time, okay, next class, we are going to talk about, so it is important to read ahead. Are we, are we good? Oh, you haven't taken, you can still find it. I mean, it's, got, it's going to be called, you know, using today's date role and you have until 6.50 to do it. All right, so next week, next Tuesday is important because next Tuesday, we are moving on to, we are, tonight's lab is two's complement. So you know, make sure that you wait for me to give you the access code first. But next week, we are gonna talk about binary number comparison. Okay, uh, on this one, you cannot see this one, you can only see this one because you know, 
Occasionally, I would obsolete some of my own notes. It's like, oh, that's a clumsy way to explain something, and I'll replace it with something hopefully a little bit better. So read this one, okay, before next Tuesday, uh, because it's not as easy as you think it is. Because what we are trying to find out, what we are trying to figure out is if I have a big part of X and a big part of Y, how can I know whether X is less than Y? That's the only thing I need to know, okay? Is the middle end less than the subtract end? When you have X minus Y, X is called the middle end, and then Y is called the subtract end. Okay, so please read that module before next Tuesday, and also make sure that if, if you have any question about the material up to this point, make sure those are all clear by the time you get to that module. But you don't want to go yet unless you want to go to the lab and wait for me to be there before you can get started. So today's lab is two's complement, which is basically just you know exercising things that you have learned in today's class. And the access code is, okay, let me change this one first. So the access code is complementary. Yes, it is kind of a long word. It's not the other complementary. It's not this complementary, it's the complete long E mentory because it is not a complement. This is actually the opposite, right? You know, to make up for the difference. All right. Oh, gosh, I actually let you guys out five minutes early. Dang it. You don't get a refund. <laughs>